Clap your hands if you are crazy, must say clap your hands. Domino Thinking presents Natural Born Speakers with your host, Allison Donaghy. If you are born to talk and want to know how to build your career around it, then Natural Born Speakers is the show for you. Now grab your seat because this is the place to be. Now here is your host, Allison. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. We have a great show lined up for you today. First, I want to give a shout out to one of our sponsors. It is Power Talks. That's Pow Her Talks. And they are coming up in Victoria pretty quick. It is a speaker series for women. There's 18 women who share the stage and they give a nine minute speech about their story, whatever that looks like to them, whatever they want it to be. It's an absolutely amazing event. You can go to powherhouse.com to get more information on it and definitely go and get your tickets it's totally worth it and if you go to our online uh, my website dominothinking.com you'll be able to actually see an earlier recording that we did about the power talks but enough about that let's get to our guest today i am super excited to have mark here I got the privilege of listening to Mark speak at Soho, which is small office, home office, which is an event that happens in Victoria. I'm sure he'll tell us a little bit more about that. But he was one of the keynote speakers there, and he was absolutely brilliant as a speaker. So when he agreed to be on our show, I was thrilled because he has such a great mm, feeling about him for lack of a better word, when he is on the stage and he's talking about it, it's such an easy mannerism and he has such a joy to listen to and, and he has a great way of weaving a story and you will definitely find out more about it when you're listening to him. But he is a marketing consultant and he's the CEO of Your Ultimate Speech. So I'm really excited to listen to more about what's going on with that. He's an entrepreneur, a brand consultant and a writer. He's also an ad man and he left the creative departments of several multinational ad agencies and he created Canes, Canes, Cons. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Is this the right like, fellow? <laughs> I talk better than I read. Oh for, oh, for God's sake, it's Con. It's the Con Film Festival. <laughs> Thank you. I know, and I even say it wrong when I say that. Canes. And so he had clients like Budweiser's <laughs> and resurrected declining brands like Mr. Clean. We love Mr. Clean. My son actually dressed up as Mr. Clean for Halloween one year. And uh, he turned the bald, ma- bald man into Proctor's worldwide turnaround of the year. So I'm going to stop actually speaking right now <laughs> because reading is just not working for me today. But And I'm really excited to get Mark to start talking. So Mark, jump right Hello. in and tell us who you are. Ah, good to meet you. Not good to meet you. I meet. I know you already, but uh, good to good to talk to you. I, I just, I, you know what? After you said Keynes, I, I think it just it threw me off my my entire conversation. We're gonna have to go ad lib. Um, oh, I'm just gonna be a few things I'm gonna say that's gonna stir up your oh shit. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, it, it, it's great being on the show. Thanks very much uh, for, for inviting me. It, it is, I got, there's, a, there's a lot of fun stories uh, to share, too. So, I mean, you mentioned I got my start in, in advertising. I worked uh, in, in uh, several big agencies around the world. Um, I was started, got my start in Hong Kong. My very first job ever was back translating a Chinese kung fu movie, which was a high watermark for me. And, uh, yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. How Chow do you, Yan how Chow. does that, okay. We well, I, I really don't even. Fun? I really don't even want to want to talk about it that much because it, it basically three words: Chinese sweatshop, and oh, uh, yeah, God. I was I was doing back translations in a sort of a sweatshop for the Hong Kong film industry, and uh, I got handed a movie called A Better Tomorrow Part Two. And if there's anybody from Hong Kong listening, that's the that's the film that launched Chow Yun Fat's career. The guy who went on, he was in Pirates of the Caribbean and, and a whole bunch of other movies. But uh, yeah, so I got to clean up the, the the translations and turn them into proper English. Anyways, that's 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 not where my career ended. I'm spending an inordinate amount of time there. But um, yeah, <laughs> oh, worked. But at, I worked. At, yeah. Oh, it's oh, I got a lot of those. Um, I went to Gray in Hong Kong, which is a big multinational ad agency, actually one of the agencies that keeps getting mentioned in Mad Men. And uh, then I went to um, BBDO, uh, which is another big multinational. They always, they always have these, uh, these letters, right? BBDO, Benton, <laughs> Bull, Durstein, and Osborne, the four dead guys. Um, and I went to work for them in Europe. And then I went back to uh, a startup agency in, in uh, Vancouver from there. 
And they became quite famous. They became, uh, in the five years I was there, or four years I was there, we, we were Canadian Agency of the Year, three times running. And then uh, I got bought by Gray again to help turn them around. And then I, uh, I left Toronto after three years of turnaround and moved back to Vancouver because I just couldn't take it anymore. That was when I was helping turn around Mr. Clean. It was one of those things where working in a turnaround is a bit like uh, saving Private Ryan in that everybody dies. You know, oh. you, you, you try, <laughs> you work the turnaround and it's super hard, especially in a company that has a lot of deep seated badness to it. And so you just throw wave after wave of soldiers against it, and they all die. And eventually you die, and then you hand it over to the peacetime army, and they uh, ride that horse to fame and accolade. So I'd done that, I've done that three times. I've done three turnarounds, which exhausted me. And then I, I thought I'd come back and sort of gather myself again. And I landed in Vancouver, and I fell in with the Green Mafia, all the yeah. folks who were trying to build sustainability up and uh, – and uh, they welcomed me with open arms, which was very surprising. I thought they'd treat me like Darth Vader because I came from the dark side. And, uh, but they were very welcoming because they needed, they needed somebody with um, big brand experience to help them make sustainability sexy. And, so, well, and definitely uh, that insight, yeah, to what works, what doesn't work. That would be oh, huge value. Oh, it, it, well, it's, it's – uh, the problem with green is that they're very sincere and worthy and noble and that makes very bad advertising because people have depressing enough lives. They don't need to be told what's worthy and what they have to buy. So right. that's, that's something the green folks have a really hard time with. They're much better now. You look at products like Method and Tesla. Um, it's a world away, but back in 2005, it was very – you should buy this because it's the right thing and nobody – Yeah, that's I mean, hard that's to like, make sexy. Oh, no, it's like your mom telling you to wear corduroys when you go to school. You know, you'll do it, but you hate her. Um, yeah, you pack a different pair of pants. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. She tells you to wear long underwear because it's going to be cold today. So, yeah, mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't like to be told that. Anyways, so, yeah, I worked on Green, and we tried to make it sexy. The problem was that Green had given itself such a bad reputation at the time in that it, if, as soon as you told, said to somebody that product is Green – uh, they would assume that it costs too much and it doesn't work very much and it's probably made for girls anyway. And so nobody would buy it. And so I worked with all these big brands like Molson and, and Unilever. Um, and what I found they wanted me for was building green into their product, something that I wasn't very well equipped for because I was working with operations more and, and advertising less. So I sold my company to an innovation firm out of Chicago and I helped them build a green innovation practice, building green into product. And um, then after two years, they hit the recession 2012 and uh, we parted ways just because there was no business to be had in green at all. Mm. And um, so I went on my own as a consultant building what I called future-proof brands. But, uh, you know, a lot of water under the bridge since then. It's, um, I wrote a book called Didn't See It Coming, which is all about the, it's a merry romp through the implosion of old school advertising and the chaos that's replaced it. And, uh, and then now um, I'm, I, I slid into sort of an entrepreneur role. In the, first, I was a consultant, which is kind of entrepreneurial, but kind of just you know doing more of what you did in an agency, but one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and then I, I, I fell in with a friend of mine who was launching a company called Search Doppler and Determine, D-T-E-R-M-I-N, which was – it was labeled as – a search optimization company for executives who don't understand search. And my job, because I'm, you know, I'm not very good in tech, my job was to be the, the gorilla who tried to break it all the time. <laughs> and if I could break the thing, then they were really happy because they got to fix it and make it better. So for eight yeah. months, that's what I did. I tried to break this thing. And, that's uh, a fun thing to do. <laughs> it's a very fun thing to do. It's a, and I couldn't believe they were happy because uh, you know I'd bang away on the keyboard like Zoolander, and uh, <laughs> and they were they were just thrilled, you know. So I I also helped them build the brand around Determine and Search Doppler and figure out who it was targeted at and all that stuff. But I got my first taste of sort of you know you build something, you launch it, and then you know then watch it go. So um, then we then I left uh, then I left uh, Vancouver because it was an expensive piece of real estate and I didn't have an office or a staff anymore so I didn't need it so we moved to Victoria and had a house built and while we were he in, in, in moving uh, the house wasn't ready so we moved to Bali for six months and oh, darn. Um, yeah yeah went surfing <laughs> went surfing for six months 
And while I was there, it just, it just impressed on me the importance of building a business that I could take anywhere. So the, your ultimate speech was created because I, I write a lot of speeches. I give a lot of speeches. Um, but mainly because I wanted a business that could work anywhere in the world in any time zone. And um, your ultimate speech is that. It, it's a virtual service uh, that helps uh, executives create TED caliber speeches in six hours. So very cool. Yeah, and it works so then, in any time zone all around the world, which is very cool. That's always nice. You can go back to Bali. I can. <laughs> yeah. Did I leave you there for a second? No, nope. I'm still oh, here. Okay. All right. Um. No. Oh, so with I, this I just, I just, I just floored you, didn't I? I just the, the yeah, conversation. You did, and I was like, "Oh, did we have a tech problem? I had one a while ago, and it sucked." But <laughs> no, <laughs> no, we're good. Um, now you said th- with the speaking, then the ultimate speech. Do you write the speech for people, or do you help them write their speeches? No, let me explain how that works. It's a pretty neat Please. process uh, because uh, the problem with speech writers is that they write speeches. And, and uh, it, people who, if you've ever heard somebody read a speech, it's, it's, it's like having your skin pulled off. It is the worst experience you can ever imagine. It, it's just terrible for everyone. And um, so the, the trick is, is to get someone to relay their thoughts in their own words. And so your ultimate speech, we created it uh, where in six uh, Skype calls, we talk to the executive, and I have a talent pool who does this. We have writers and editors and designers. So um, the very first call, I get on the call with uh, the executive, and I sort of feel out their personality, what type of person they are, what their topic is. Then I find a writer who I think would be simpatico personality-wise as well as expertise-wise. And uh, they set up their calls, usually a call every two days, an hour for each call. And um, in the first call, they set up the structure. And this is interesting because most people don't have a structure in their speech. They just talk from beginning to end. Yes. And so we set up their speeches with uh, a structure akin to well, – we have many structures we work to. We have the redemption story. We have the, hero, we have the hero's story, Joseph Campbell hero's story, uh, hero's journey rather. Um, we have the Martin Luther King, rise, fall, rise, fall. We've got the investment uh, story structure. We've got a whole bunch, but we, we put their story into a structure, almost like a Christmas tree ready to have the lights hung on it. Mm. And um, that's where we end the first call, and the writer goes back, pulls back, reports to me, reports to the editor, and we, uh, we sort of start to craft the bare bones of the speech, send it to the executive. Call number two... The writer and the executive start to jam on ideas, and the executive has been challenged now to come up with stories and anecdotes that illustrate you know, what they're trying to convey. And what we do, we hit the record button, and we just simply talk and listen and record. And what happens is it's magical because the executive gets challenged to talk in a certain structure, so they just roll out the stories that sort of fill in that structure. And um, we then transcribe that and basically massage it into the form of a speech. Third call, edit that down because oftentimes when you write something down, it doesn't come out right when you actually try to say it again. Right. Um, and the fourth call, more of the same. And then we add a slideshow, uh, what we call a breadcrumb slideshow because – if you're if you're reciting a speech with a terrible slideshow with lots of bullet points, you're just reading, which is painful. Oh, that's the worst. The absolute oh, everybody worst. Does that. Yeah, everybody yep. does that. And then the other alternative is a lot of people just stand up on stage and talk because they think they're they're all that, and mm-hmm. they don't. They're not. And it, that's a bit hard too because it's like it's like learning a whole Broadway play. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have to learn the entire ninety minutes. So. We construct a slideshow that's usually all visuals, very striking and graphic, but it leads them along from one little signpost to the next. And so they only ever have to memorize about 30 seconds of their speech. Um, the effect is miraculous. It, it, it's unbelievable because you have people who are nervous as heck and they can get through a speech on maybe two or three rehearsals. It's, it's, very cool. it's phenomenal because they don't have to remember that much. They keep getting these little... You know, these little reminders, uh, go here, now go here, now go here. And um, our promise is that uh, if they lose their script, if they're jet lagged, if the slideshow goes down, they could sit up on stage and basically tell stories 
around a structure and be voted the best speech of the conference. So very yeah. cool. Yeah. It works. I love it. I love it. And I love that you get them just telling you their stories that they've thought up because that's so much more effective, I would imagine, and which is probably why you do it, is because when people start telling their stories, they get lost in their story and it sounds far more authentic when they're doing it as opposed oh, yeah. to just trying to get a good grade from you. I, I, um, I, I, uh, we do a thing called presentation polish. If people already have a presentation, they come to us for a little less money and we just polish it up, shine it up. And we had a lady mm-hmm. the other day come to us for presentation polish and she had to do like a 15, 20 minute talk. And all we, we took, we threw away the notes. So she got extremely good value for her money because we started from <laughs> zero again. And, but all we did, we said, you're not going to, you're not going to have any slides. You're just going to talk, but these are the three topics that you're going to talk on. And here's story one, story two, story three. Here's the connectors. Go. She rehearsed it twice, and she killed it. It was it was phenomenal because all she was doing was telling stories she's told around the kitchen table since she was a little girl. Now, Super cool, and it's definitely a theme. Like those best speeches are the ones that have great stories. Like it just yeah. it seems to be what we need most after air and water and food and shelter is stories. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's what connects us as people, right? Yeah. It's good for the soul. So back to the your comment about the slideshows. Yeah. What, uh, how, many, how many slides do you think is appropriate for oh. a speech? Like how many should you have? And can you just give an example of how to turn a bad slide into a good slide? Terrific. That's a terrific question because, uh, you know, you get all these rules. Well, you should only have 10 slides or 20 slides. My last keynote uh, that I gave um, for the BC Marketing Association, I gave a 30-minute keynote with 60 slides in it. So that's six mm-hmm. zero. And wow. I mean, it's staggering. I almost crashed the computer with that. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I look at it and I go, I, I read through the script and at every, this, this is the way I put a good slideshow together. Whenever there's a pause, whenever I run out of gas, whenever there's a sort of a slight change in theme, you know, where you go from one sentence to the next, I'm going, now I'm changing my idea. Where you go from one paragraph to the next, and there's a bit of a shift in ideas, you go, is that a place for a good signpost? And mm. if yes, I highlight it in red on the script that I write out for myself. And... Um, and I, we put those slides together, and sometimes it's 20, sometimes it's 40. Like I said, the last one was 60 slides, which was huge. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, then I, I, what I do, I take the slideshow, uh, which isn't a slideshow. It's just a bunch of highlights on a piece of paper now, on a, on a script. And I open up a uh, PowerPoint or Keynote, which is what I use, and I just write down a couple of words. Uh, so, man you know, man reaching to sky, uh, boy fishing, things like that. And Mm -hmm. with those slides, let's say those 60 slides that are just blank white pieces of paper uh, with a couple of words, I go through my script and I try to put away the paper and see if those slides, just those words, will guide me through the entire speech without screwing up too badly. And if they do, I know I'm onto something. So that's sort of stage one. We still haven't pulled out a single photo yet mm-hmm. um then what i do if if I, you know i tweak it if some might be redundant superfluous i there might be holes where i trip where i need an extra slide to prop me up uh so i tweak 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 a little bit and uh then what i do uh, i go to my my uh, log of stock photos and iStockphoto.com and all the places you find photos and i just start to put photos in there that express that idea. So man reaching to sky, obviously, is a man reaching to sky. Or metaphor for the well is empty, you know. Right. And I just, I just try to get uh, high, high resolution photos that look like beautiful posters or wallpaper and just put them on there. Sometimes the metaphor needs a little explaining, so I'll put one or two words in there, a couple of graphic effects, nothing very dramatic. By the way, there's also never a transition in my slideshow, so all the flippy dippy things that people see, you know, I don't. There's none of that, and let that be mm-hmm. a warning to people too, because one of the biggest things that I see happen: you send your slides into a conference, they load it into a different format computer, and all your transitions go crazy. Mm. So basically, they break your slideshow, and you get there, and you're completely hooped. So 
But that's right. a whole other story. Now, uh, if they if it actually works though on their system, do you advise it or do you just find it distracting no, as a general I rule? Find I find it stupid. Uh, okay. They're there to see you. If if you're uh, if you, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Tell clear? us how you really feel, Mark. <laughs> oh, I think it's stupid. Uh, because what they're there, people are not at a talk to see your content. They're not there to read your content. They're not there to see how clever you can be with a computer. They're there because they desperately want to connect with you and like you. That's why they're sitting in the audience. They want to like you. And if you put all these transitions that look like snowflakes or, you know, twist and turns, all it convinces them of is that you're a nerd. And that's that's not a good that's not a good thing. You can, you know, you can you can be very creative, I believe in your shows. I've seen terrific shows where they don't unpack a single slide, where they just basically write it on a piece of paper. Now, you look at one of the grand, one of the big daddies of uh, business speeches, and that's Simon Sinek's Start With Why, mm-hmm. or Why Movements Fail. Um, I think it's called. It's a TED Talk. And he uses a flip chart with a felt pen. Yes. And, and oh he kills God. it. Hello. Yeah. If, that's my mom, if that's my mom, I'm not here. <laughs> I know uh, I'm usually oh, so oh, good oh, about turning all this tech no, stuff that's, off. That's, not that's today. Okay. That's okay. It's probably, it's probably somebody important. Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh, they can wait. You're more they important, can Mark. They can wait. God. <laughs> Screw them. You can, they can wait. wait. I got you, you know, on the phone. Do they know who I am? Um, uh, clearly no, they do not. <laughs> clearly they do not. Or else they're calling to yell at you to get me off the air. Um, but yeah, it's, I just think that people, they just want to see the unvarnished you you know, what you talk about storytelling, because stories are a way to connect us as people, right? And they want to go, I like this guy, I like this lady. And if they like you, then after the speech, they'll walk up to you, they'll give you their business card, they'll share a story. If it's a business setting, then there's a much, much greater chance of you getting a card that becomes a valuable lead if they just like you. If you show them nothing but information, they will not like you. And mm. forget, you won't impress them by, by showing them reams of information. They'll just think that you're an egotist or you're insecure. Yeah, so, I just think I could have just bought the book. You could buy the book. The why $200 gonna... for the conference or whatever. Exactly. <laughs> so why are you even here? Now, this is very disarming because you start to work with executives and inevitably uh, they send you their slideshow because they think they've got it nailed. And it is that. It's death by PowerPoint. You've seen it before. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so you start to dis- dismember that. And then the first thing you do, you say, I'm, I want to throw away the, the 50 points that you think you have to make. And I just want you to tell some stories. You get to the gist of their, 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 their speech, which is this new technology is amazing or uh, the story of my startup or whatever it may be. And you just say, tell me the story behind that. And they just it's completely disarming for them. It throws them off their game and they start to rattle it off. And you can see them. Over Skype, start, the, the shoulders start to straighten up. They lighten up. They're starting to have fun. And they can't believe that that could actually be a speech. Yeah. You know? Yeah. They, it is. Yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a huge difference between talking to, like, listening to a stiff board and listening to somebody that you just want to have over for drinks so that you can continue on the conversation. Bingo. And, and mm-hmm. the, unfortunately, the speeches that we love to hear as people are the speeches that we're afraid to write as people because mm. we just we're so insecure we think we're going to be judged by our intelligence when nothing could be further from the truth they they judge us on our personality and uh right. nobody wants to be the stuffed shirt you know <laughs> well and so. our stories always sound more interesting to the other person like we've lived yeah. it we've done it we've told them 6 million times we don't necessarily think they're interesting anymore but yeah. the audience has never heard them before and oh, yeah. and I, sometimes we can lose sight of the value of their fresh ears on it. Yep, totally, mm-hmm. totally. Now, do you remember? Wanna... Do you remember? Do you remember the Go story ahead. that I told at Soho? Do oh my god, any... yeah, it was so good. Which one did I tell? What did I tell? Um, <laughs> that was the one about the dog treats. Yeah, bingo. Now, yeah. how long was that? How long ago was that show? Oh, that was January, was it? Okay, that I we had a, I had a speech in January that you saw once, yeah. and you remember the story. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And not just that, but I've been thinking about it ever since. Like, how can I apply it to my business? How can Mm -hmm. I do my marketing differently? And and there was actually something that you had said. I was going to talk about it later. But I know when you were talking about your book, which I want to come around back to again in in a little bit. But you had said um, 
oh, if you want somebody to design the cover of your book, tell them to win an award and then just yeah. let them go to the thing, right? And yes. the amount of ways that I've sort of been able to use that in my own life mm-hmm. in with staff saying, hey, how about you, how, how would you make this customer the happiest? And, mm-hmm. and they come up with great ideas. How would you fix this problem? And so there's all of this great stuff that you can incorporate um, into it. Like, yeah. and so your speech had so much value and still here we are. And I just went to social media camp and I probably heard about, I don't know, eight different speakers, mm-hmm. but they weren't telling stories the way you were telling stories. And it's the stories I remember for sure. Well, that's, that's a wonderful compliment. I mean, when I, when, I first draw, when I first drew you out with the challenge about what stories did I tell, it wasn't sort of like a, a thing to rah-rah mark. But, it, 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 <laughs> but, I just, no, but I just find it amazing because if you tell a flippin' funny story, and yeah. I love those stories, when you tell right. that story, you'll remember it for the rest of your life. And mm-hmm. tell me how many speeches do you hear where you remember anything beyond what was on the menu at lunchtime? You, well, you don't remember that either. Yeah. But well, uh, and to be fair, the stories yeah. that we were the speakers at so, uh, social media camp, they were very much about giving us information. It was more of a teaching type scenario. So if I look back at my notes, then I can remember stuff. But mm-hmm. it's not that same um, storytelling experience. It's a totally yeah. different speaking, but it's the difference between remembering it and having to refer back in order to remember the points. Yeah. So I don't want it to come across as I'm saying anything bad about the speakers at uh, social media camp because they were really freaking phenomenal, like in, mm-hmm. in, a, in, a, in their own right. But mm-hmm. it wasn't. Not, there was just, no not as, just not as amazing as me, that's all. You not know. as amazing as you, Mark. <laughs> oh, well, except for Bosco, <laughs> who I'm going to actually have on the show in a, oh, in a few weeks. God. He was pretty yeah. incredible, too. <laughs> oh, man. No, there's, there's a lot of good speakers. But the good ones, the good ones, uh, if you have to pack in information to something I learned in advertising is if you can if you can make people smile or cry or evoke some kind of emotion. And that's what a story does. Yeah. Then if you're good enough at it, they might reward you with a bit of attention so you can slap them with a bit of information or, or intelligence, you know, so it, but it relaxes you, them enough to learn. Bingo. You can't, yeah. but you can't just come out of the gate swinging with reams of information because you'll kill them. They won't pay attention, you right. know. So yeah. at Soho, there's a lot of guys who are very good out there, uh, but you have to. They, I think, what they know is that they they have to they have to start in with a story or relate information to a story, so it makes it easier for you to pick it up, you know, mm-hmm. and keep. For sure, yeah, and it's relevant. Like yeah. It's- what you were saying, I can relate to my life and my business for sure. Yeah, yeah exactly. Now, to circle back to the PowerPoints for a second. So if you're on stage and you have those PowerPoints and you're lucky enough to have a screen in front of you so you can see what you're actually clicking to, that's bonus. But if you don't and the screen is behind you, how do you advise people to handle that? Absolutely no problem. I learned this from a brilliant presentation coach, a guy who coached um, Australia when they won the Olympics. Really good coach. His name is Barry Snetzinger, lives in Toronto. And, um, and he said, you know, you can interact with the screen behind you. There is nobody saying that you can't turn around and look at the screen. In fact, what you can do, and I, 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 I counsel people when I, when I coach them, I say, when you get up on stage, the first thing you do is shut up. And just take a look around and, and just give everybody a smile. And it's very disconcerting for people. When they're in the audience and you stand up on stage and you just kind of give them a look, you're already freaking them out. You're already different from everybody else and they're starting to pay attention. So you start with that. Then I've, it happens all the time. Every speaker this happens to, you hit that blank where, uh, where you forget what you were saying, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And just like now, um, you, hit that <laughs> blank, you hit that blank where you forget what you were saying. And most people will jump in with a compensating measure. They'll go, oh, I can't believe I just forgot what I was saying. Uh, hold on a minute. And they look like idiots. Yes. What I learned, though, from Barry was shut up. Just look at the audience for a second. You've made a point. You have no idea where you're going to go. But shut up and look at the audience and smile. And they're going to think that you're a genius. They're thinking, wow, this guy's thinking some huge new thought. Or he's letting that point sink in and he's a great orator. They have no idea that there's a hamster wheel, that a hamster is just running around inside your head going, what am I doing? Um, right. It has a terrific effect. Now, to your original question, slides. 
you uh, don't have a monitor in front of you. 90% of the time when I speak, I don't have a monitor in front of me. Mm-hmm. So what I do, and I, I, can't, uh, I can't rehearse, I can't do the whole speech live. I need props. I need to look at the slides. Um, what I do, I stop and I click to the next slide. And oftentimes what I'll do, I'll go, look at this. You know what this reminds me of? And I'll actually go up and I'll touch the screen. So you bring the screen into it. You go, look, this is a guy fishing. Now, doesn't that remind you of something? And <laughs> you bang on the screen wall. And, and it, it has, it's a phenomenal effect because what you're doing is it's almost like you're walking people through a museum, showing them a painting, and then highlighting stuff for them to look at. Look at this. Look at that. Look at this. And it brings them <laughs> it brings them out of their seats and they start paying attention. So I have absolutely no qualms about hitting change slide, taking a breath, looking around at the audience, taking a quick look at the slides behind me and just going, and this is what I have to say about that. You know, right. people, people don't go, he doesn't remember. They think you're a genius because you're pausing. And you're giving them a chance to think between yep. the information that you're giving them, which is... Yep. You know, it's great. Like how many speakers just keep rambling on and on and you're still stuck on sentence two and they're on sentence 12 and you're like, yep. whoa, I have to catch up now. Yep. Yeah. And uh, and you did do this when you spoke at Soho mm-hmm. and it creates this energy on stage as well. Like there's that movement, there's that intention mm-hmm. and there's a deliberateness. Like when you're when you're you know pointing at something and you're getting excited about what's up there, we, we, we pick up on that energy and it, you could feel it. It was it was very effective. Now, there's another thing that, that I want to highlight for people. Uh, I, uh, Aristotle said there's three great elements to every speech, uh, three elements to every great speech. One is logos, which is the substantiation. Now, most people, when they do a speech, it's 100% substantiation. It's all the facts, all the PowerPoint, all the, all the garbage bullet points. That's what people throw into their speeches, and that's why they're terrible. Now, you need that. But let me, let me go on. You also need ethos, which is credibility as an expert. People need to feel like you really feel confident, and that's why you pause. That's why you bring in quotes from other smart people. That's why you tell stories about how you started the company, if that's what it's about. And finally, there's pathos, which is empathy, which is they need to like you as a person, and that is where most speakers fall short. So they, mm-hmm. instead of it should be pathos first, so they like you, ethos so they trust you that you actually know what you're talking about because you're an expert and only finally then logos the substantiation and i don't know if you remember but uh from social um soho but what i the first thing i told everybody is to put their pens down uh Mm -hmm. and don't write down anything what i'm going to say because i've got a landing page at the end of the speech that has the manuscript and all the information they could want Right. And that's a trick that I use all the time. So I say, don't write anything down. If you want any of this information, the last slide is going to be a landing page. Just click on that and you can download the free PDF of the speech. With, and it's done in a manuscript, like in a book. So you can, mm-hmm. you can actually read it. It's not just slides. And you know how people, when they give you slides with bullet points on it, it looks terrible. This actually, it looks and like a And then you man- don't know what the in-between spots are saying? Yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, I don't just, remember how, what that, yeah, that word meant. Yeah. It's lazy and terrible. But um, yeah, so the logos should be left for the leave behind, which is here's the final slide, go download it. And that has an added benefit if you're in a business setting. You say, go download it. Here's the landing page. Now on the landing page, it gives you a brief description of what the speech was about. It gives you a link to a PDF of your manuscript done in nice prose form so it's easy to read. And finally, and most important, it gives you more information. Sign up for my newsletter. Here's the next speech. Here's a webinar. So what you do is basically draw people into your circle. And in business, that's what it's all about, right? It's about making new friends and and moving them along that lead generation sort of uh, pipeline. Right, which segues us nicely into what I was going to ask you next about selling from the stage. Selling from and the I stage. Did, I should say actually that I thought it was brilliant that you did that because my pen immediately went down, and then I realized I'm going to have to stay to the end. <laughs> yeah. Oh well. Yeah. There's a funny New Yorker cartoon, uh, and it's a guy standing up on the stage, and he says, "I'm going to start. I'm gonna, uh, so today I'd like to give you a really lame list, uh, or uh, 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 a search-ready listicle followed by a passive-aggressive sales tactic." <laughs> and that's what, and that's what most speeches are. Basically, they go, "I'd like to give you five ways to be more successful." And they, you know, it, they're awful. They're mm. awful, awful things. And and 
Everybody does it. You know, here's three steps. You probably wonder how you could be more successful, don't you? Well, I've got three steps. Blah, 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 blah. And they tell you that crap. And then it's some passive aggressive sales tactic where it's like, you know, you don't have to buy now. But I can tell you, this is only going to last for a little while. And it's, it's Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, you know. It's, mm. it's, it's 1980s style, you know, rich dad, poor dad, Tony Robbins selling techniques. And um, it's just, I just find it tasteless. I, I don't know. I'd rather not close a deal <laughs> than go on stage and, and do some sort of SEO friendly uh, five list listicle followed by some passive aggressive, you know, sales pitch. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just no fun. I'm up there. I'm up there to give them a gift. And, and the way I write scripts for other people, you're up there to give people the gift, free value, nothing expected in return. Let's just have a good time together and maybe you'll remember the story. And I think and it, it, the beautiful, I think, end result for that is that the people that end up working with you, you're going to want to work with. Mm-hmm. If you are putting somebody in a fear-based position, mm-hmm. then you're, you're going to be working with somebody who's fear-based. Mm-hmm. And I don't know about you, but I never think that's terribly fun. I no, much prefer to deal with people who are excited to work with me because they've made that choice. They've gone on my website. They've done, you know, whatever it is they've had to do. They've listened to a couple of shows and then they say, "Ooh, I think this would be a really great fit. Working is so much easier at that point. Oh, well, think of it. If you do one of those things, hey, you don't have to buy now, but I can tell you the price is going to go up. Who are you going to get? You're going to get somebody who's down, to the, down on their luck, who is looking for a Hail Mary pass, who's yeah. looking for you know, a miracle and nobody gets miracles. There is no such thing. Uh, And so there they are. And now they're your customer. Now you've got a guy who's expecting you to do miracles and boy, are you going to disappoint them? You know? Mm -hmm. So no, I, I'd rather just, I, I like giving out free advice. It's, it's one of those things, uh, a hero of mine, Blair ends B L A I R E N N S. He does a thing called win without pitching. And it is the one business book apart from why Johnny can't brand that I recommend to everyone. It's called the win without pitching manifesto. It is pure gold. And what he talks about is that you're up on stage to impart free value Think about scientists. Think about doctors. What they do, they publish or perish. They're forced at regular intervals to go out and share their hard-won knowledge with everyone for free. Now, that doesn't mean that they cheapen their offering. In fact, more people come to them. But right. if, you, if you give away the bounty for free, people are going to go, Jesus, you know, he or she must be really smart. If they can afford to give this away for free, imagine what they got tucked in their jacket. You know? Yes. People don't go. It reminds me of like that Groupon mentality. Yes. So here you are, you're a massage therapist, and you put a Groupon out, and everybody gets your massage for 40 bucks, but regularly it's 120. Is anybody ever going to pay $120 for your massage? No. No. They're not going to. And so they're going to wait for the next Groupon and then come back and have another massage for $40, and you're going to be out of business. And that's the same sort of thing. You're. I think you're cheapening what you have to do when, when you do it that way. The, as soon as somebody says to me, well, it's a limited time, I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I want to do this. No, it's like a bloody <laughs> Persian carpet going out of business sale. It's like, yeah. you know, it's like one of those places that are permanently going out of business because they're, they're, they're shady dealers. Mm-hmm. And I, I would much rather say, you know what, I will give you in a speech everything that I know because I know a speech is a bit like sheet music. It comes down to how you play that damn piano. So if I give you everything for free in a speech, you're going to come back and say, now, can you customize that to me? And I go, yeah, of course. That, I mean, and I, I, won't, I won't reduce my price for you, but you'll be happy to pay it because you know that the brains are the brains that you want, you know? Yes. Yeah. It's, so. um, I, yeah, I think you have so many really great points and great tips, which explains why you are in the speech writing business. Yeah. <laughs> like, and then, so what are some of the, um, the difficulties that you encounter with this sort of thing? Is it, you know, maybe people who don't want to talk about the way you want them to talk? Like, how do you deal with that? If somebody's like, well, I'm not telling a story, then what? Like, do you just say, well, that's part of a deal, so see you later? Or do you try to give them a more interesting, boring speech? Like, how do you deal with that? You know what? It's, uh, it's, uh, that's a really cool question because I am currently working with a guy. His name is Raf. Mm-hmm. And he was my old boss at the uh, at the innovation agency. And Raf is a very big brain, and he has got a very complex concept that he's trying to convey. 
And uh, Raf has been the toughest speech that I've written, and I don't think he'd mind me talking about this because it's not. Let's any, hope not. <laughs> yeah, it's not. Any I'm going to tag him, him in him. this. No. no, exactly, exactly. You can tag tag Raf, but um, it's not any slight to him. But he's got a very complex topic. And what we did, I put one of my best writers on to the on to Raf, and he worked with him, and he couldn't do it. Raf said, no, it's too simplistic. You're trying to create a simple, simple story out of something that's not. It's, in fact, it's called complex adaptive learning. And it looks like uh, the equations in a beautiful mind, a whole bunch of math equations. It's very hard stuff. Mm-hmm. And so I said, okay. I, I, gave, uh, you know, I paid my writer and I said, you know what, Raf, I'll, I'll do this speech. And it broke me. I couldn't do it either. And so I went away for a while. And then um, uh, it so happens that we created an augment to uh, the speech product. It was called a So What Do I Do Anyway pitch. It's a mini pitch done on slides. It's basically a, a, a resume, but done in a smart, creative, fun way. And if people want to see them, they can go to Mark Stoiber's slide share. And I've done a ton of these things now because once I did one for myself, everybody came out of the woodwork and wanted one because nobody can explain what the hell they do. So... <laughs> I went back to Raf and I said, Raf, I've got this so what do I do anyway thing on SlideShare. You want to take a look? And I, so I showed it to him and I did one for him, which broke down what he did from a completely different perspective and hyper simplistic but different. And he loved it. Then what we did, we turned that so what do I do anyway into a long form speech. And he loved that. So... It, basically, we just did a jujitsu. We we turned the whole thing around on its head and took the structure away and all the sort of forms that we usually use. We just had to think on our feet, but um, it came out brilliantly. And that's been the the toughest one so far. Honestly, the the thing we get um, most of is that people come to us with a with a very very information heavy. Uh, presenter centric that is I want to talk about what I do and my features and all the stuff the company's known for and they don't think about the benefits why somebody in the audience even cares so what we do we take away that we take away that features talk the bullet point talk and we talk more about what connects them to people we always start our our second conversations once we've laid out the structure and they give us the, the bullet point heavy stuff and we say, what would John F. Kennedy say? Would John F. Kennedy talk about these 20 bullets? And they're like, oh, no, I don't think so. And, uh, and so we go, well, let's not. And, uh, and so what we do, we elevate it up to this level of vision, you know, this level of greatness. And we throw the bullet points away. And time after time after time, the comment that we get back is, I didn't know I had that idea in me. Wow. So everyone starts out complex and talking about all the features and everybody ends up talking about benefits and human connection and sounding just a little bit more like JFK or Martin Luther King or Steve Jobs. Mm-hmm. Which is, it's from an audience perspective, way, way better. But why do you think it's changed? Why do you think it went from that very technical, dry type speaking to this? I don't think it's ever changed. Uh, I think that most, I mean, you and I both know that, uh, who was it? Jerry Seinfeld said that uh, in survey after survey, uh, public speaking is listed right up there with uh, dying as the most terrifying thing that people can do. And he says, in fact, uh, public speaking is listed higher than dying for most people. So that means that the guy giving the eulogy at the funeral (laughs) is probably more scared than the guy in the casket. And, And so people, when you're afraid of something, you don't go at it. You push it to the side of the desk and push it off, and, I'll do, and then it's Sunday night, speech is Monday morning. You bang it out. It's terrible. Then you give the talk, and you sound like a sack of crap, and you go, next time. Next time I'll do it. Next time, it's like next time I'll floss my teeth. I will right. not. You know, I, will, <laughs> I will not piss off my dentist. <laughs> I will not have cavities again. That was too painful. And then you go right back to the old behavior. So I think that's as old as time itself. And uh, I, the difference – Allison, I think the biggest difference is that now people are losing confidence in corporate messaging and they are looking for authentic communication with leaders. So they're not looking to Patagonia, the company, to tell them. They're looking to Yvonne Schwinnard, the president of Patagonia, and they want to connect personally with this dude. 
You know, they want to see if they like him. And if they like him, they'll buy his shirts. You know, Unilever, they don't want to talk about Unilever. They want to hear about Paul Pullman, the, the, the boss who, you know, turned the company into a green company. They want to hear his story. You know, they want to hear from Bill Ford. They want to hear the stories of the real dudes. They want to hear Elon Musk talk, even though he's a terrible speaker. But uh, Steve Jobs, you know. Um, it's, it's become more important for us to cut through the, the, the superficial marketing crap and get real stories from real people. And so executives are being thrust into the spotlight more than they have before. They used to be able to hide behind Tony the Tiger and Mr. Clean and God only knows who. Uh, but now they got to stand up there and people are looking to them to inspire. And most people can't. And why do you think that is? Like, what do you think has been the shift in society? Is it just because we've become um, disconnected with internet and now we're looking for connection? Or is it because we have so much access now through the internet, we want more access? Like, what do you I think, think it, is causing I think that? It's very, I, think it's, I think it's a very, very simple thing. In the past, I mean, when I started in advertising, we had three channels, two newspapers, and a couple of magazines. Then it grew to, a, you know, like a plethora of magazines, whole bunch of TV channels. And then the internet happened. And essentially, we got, we got uh, just a, a fire hose of choice. More important, though, so, so we don't have to watch ads anymore. More important, though, people feel not only entitled to, but obligated to call bullshit on guys who are making shady claims in advertising. And I, wa- I worked in advertising, and all the claims that we make are based on small innovations dressed up as huge innovations. So, you know, I think the classic case of that, and it was done tongue in cheek, but it's perfect, is Cheerios Diamonds. You know, we introduced Cheerios Diamonds, which is basically the square turned on its side. And they turned that into an ad campaign, which was hilarious and took a stab at the, at the ridiculous, uh, you know, um, um, uh, puffery of advertising. So people go, this is bullshit. I'm not going to believe that. It's not going to change my life. Now that happened. So people feel entitled and obligated to call bullshit. And then we started in the road of sustainability. So people started making claims that this shampoo is going to be better for panda bears or orangutans. And I tell you, if I make a claim for my shampoo that it's going to make your hair shiny and it doesn't, you're going to be mad. But Mm -hmm. if I make a claim that my shampoo is going to save orangutans and it doesn't, you're going to kill me. (laughs) So Get off my mountain. Yeah, exactly. It was citizen journalism (laughs) combined with sustainability, two big earth-shaking global trends that I think caused people to call bullshit. And and we all collectively woke up and looked at advertising. We go, this stuff is just garbage. So all these slick million-dollar commercials, and I've made my share, they're all called to the carpet as bullshit. And what we're looking for instead was the executive to stand up there, and we want to know if he's a good guy or if she's a good lady. Mm -hmm. And if we trust them, then we'll go, okay, maybe we'll buy Budweiser, you know? Right. That's like the so, movie that um, Robin Williams did, that yes. sad movie, where yes. Volvo, they're boxy, but they're good. Yes, 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 yes. Right. I mean, yes, That's- exactly. It's, it's like how to get ahead in advertising, too, you know, it's, mm-hmm. uh, or, or crazy people where it's uh, Porsche. Uh, you'll get laid with one, you just won't get laid in one. Yeah, it's... <laughs> Truth in yeah. advertising. It's the reality of it all, right? What a concept. Exactly. Yeah. But I think that's really? why speeches are, are this product is right place, right time, because we're finding ourselves in a time where executives are called out of the shadows and into the spotlight and they don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. You know? So, and they've always, no, they've never known what to do, but they've never had to stand up as much as they have to stand up now. Mm-hmm. You know? So that's, do you think that's making stuff better. Yes. There's yes. more accountability. Because imagine you're a tobacco executive and you have to stand up there in front of a whole bunch of people and say tobacco smoke is not harmful. That's really, really hard. It's a lot easier to put Joe Camel, the camel up there, or the Marlboro Cowboy and go be macho and smoke. You've come a long way, baby. You come a long way, baby. It's way easier to hide behind a million dollar commercial than it is to come out and go, yeah, we had to recall our car because we were lying on the emissions reports. Sorry, you know, right. it's super hard to do that. And the the person who has the balls to do that, we go, hey, buddy, hats off, you know. Right. Um, 
and Provided I know that you then follow up with what they're saying. <laughs> Bingo, because, because we're watching. I like you, but I only like you so much in that I'm going to be tracking you now. And if you don't do it, I'm going to kill you. So yeah. I, think it's a, I think it's a good thing for all of us that people are being called on stage to say, this is my company, blemishes and all, and I swear I'm going to make it better. Uh, people like that a lot more, and it, it's much better for business because it, it makes us be better people in business if we can't Do hide behind you think behind we could get BC Ferries out maybe on uh, this issue? I, I, I think that there are some businesses that are so... <laughs> entrenched in comfort of bureaucracy and government and big business that they don't have to do that yet. Yeah. But I think they have the, a monopoly. It's tough for the yeah. people who are listening here. We live on Vancouver Island and Mark's down in Victoria. I'm in Nanaimo, so I'm sent more central and we have to take a ferry to get off this Island. Granted, we chose to live here. And so we're choosing to deal with the ferry situation, but they have a monopoly and they hold us hostage at times. So we're not always very happy with them. So that's who we're talking about. And they need to, you know, fix, their shit yeah it's <laughs> you know it's just one of those things I, I i you know some people when i started in on the green uh starting to help green companies uh, advertise their stuff they the, the 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 point was always made why don't we go after the people who doubt green and why don't we go after the the haters and that's like don't do that because there's way too many people who like you ignore the haters they're going to come along anyway uh, with BC Ferries, I would say ignore stuff like that. Let's get the companies that are scrappy and entrepreneurial, get them standing up on stage, making a great impression, taking over the world, becoming the next Facebook and or Tesla or whoever. And uh, and the big guys, forget about them. It's like my friend, uh, Dame, uh, who was it? Uh, Heliwell. David Heliwell said, uh, because they're working on um, energy efficiency measures and uh, their their biggest competition is sort of hydro and they're just a whole bunch of old guys who want to keep building dams, according to Mr. Heliwell <laughs> and myself. <laughs> I'll take full blame for that. But I said, how's the green it's battle reasonable. going? He says, yeah, he says we're winning one, one retirement party at a time. And I think that is <laughs> the best way to summarize it. So we can't change hydro, but I can tell you one retirement party at a time, things are coming around. Excellent. So. Yeah. Well, I was talking to some union reps from BC Ferries and they want to see things change. So maybe something will happen internally. I'm holding out hope on that one. Wow. We but, with the union reps are hoping for change. That's like that's like that's that's that doesn't happen. That's I know. Incredible. Wow. They they are a little they were a little embarrassed, I think, to be saying that that's where they worked. And so oh. yeah, you know, my suggestion was, well, change things from the inside. Like we're not we're going to see you as separate. So yeah. don't present yourself as separate. I'm sorry, you work for BC Ferries. You are BC Ferries. But yeah. I digress because this is, you know, <laughs> this is change. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, I do want to mention again your book, Didn't mm-hmm. See It Coming. Mm-hmm. And where can people find it? Where can people find it? Amazon.ca, Amazon.com, or they can go to my website. I've got one website uh, for myself, which is Mark Stoiber, M A R C S T O I. B-E-R dot com, markstoiber dot com. They can Google my name. Uh, they can get to my website through LinkedIn. Um, so they'll find my book there. They'll find it on amazon.ca. They'll find it on amazon.com. Uh, and then also if they want to know more about the speech product, including seeing we now have a TEDx talk up on there and we have a young uh, president, a uh, global young president speech that was done in Dubai by a very powerful speaker who is a client of ours. Um, those are both live speeches on our website now, so they can check that out. Uh, but that's at yourultimatespeech.com. So yourultimatespeech.com, folks can go check that out. Okay. Now, can they link back and forth between the two? So if they only have to remember one, or no, is they it just can, best they remember both? No, they can. I mean, if they can, if they can find my name, they can find mm-hmm. everything. So just look oh, up Mark. everything. So anything everything. anybody wanted to know about Mark, you can find it every, online. Every, yeah, every nasty detail, and I guess it's kind of disappointing that my life doesn't even have that many nasty details. <laughs> so, so there won't even be there won't even be that much. They all happened before Google, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah, before the when you were in Hong Kong. Before, like, yeah, when back before electricity. Um, <laughs> yeah, when no, if only they just channels. exactly just go to Mark Stoiber, M A R C. That is M A R C. Stoiber, S T O I B E R. Just Google me, and you'll find my website. You'll find didn't see it coming you'll find your ultimate speech they're all they're all there and give us a little bit of a breakdown of what is the book about 
What's the book about? Well, it starts out as, as my personal journey through the disillusionment of advertising and how advertising imploded on itself. Uh, so I, I start by telling a, a story um, about how I sort of uh, gave up on, on mainstream advertising and, and went to green, green advertising. And uh, so then it's, I, I sort of break down all the things that have happened. We've discussed a lot of it, you know, the, the rise of citizen journalism, the rise of sustainability, the, the rising awareness around hyperconsumption and how advertising, if we do our job properly, all we're going to do is kill the world quicker because we are the representatives of planned obsolescence. So I cover all that stuff. But the main thing, people, if you don't get scared – uh, the main thing is it's a fun romp. So it's there's a lot of there's a lot of funny stories in there. Part two of the the book it there it's sort of broken into two parts. Part two of the book uh, diagrams sort of the things that brands are going to need if they're going to hope to survive and thrive in this chaotic new world. Mm-hmm. So, Terrific. and it has it has won a, it has won a few awards. It's sold a whole bunch of stuff, and uh, it's also won design awards. So you know, back <laughs> I was going to gonna say I love the cover. So yeah. for no other reason, you want to buy it, get the cover because the cover is incredible, and then you can jive on all the information inside. Exactly. Well, hats off to Rethink, the agency. Uh, we all worked together at Palmer Jarvis DDB, and then the boys at, Re- uh, at Palmer Jarvis broke off and started their own agency called Rethink, Rethink Advertising. And uh, they designed the cover, and, and they did me a huge favor because I, I mentioned them in the book, and I know them really well. And I said, would you do me a solid and, and design a cover? And the, the, only, the only condition that I set for them was that the boss, my friend, had to like it and that it would win awards. And I can tell you, if you want to inspire young designers, that's what you say. Your boss has to like it and it has to win awards because their boss likes some pretty radical stuff. So, uh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, like that. You know, it's funny because I said that to somebody the other day because they said, oh, you know, I want to design this thing. And I said, this is this is what I was told by Mark. (laughs) Get them to win an award and let them do whatever they want with it. And yeah. they just was like, oh, no, fool. I can't do that. And I'm like, let them do their nuts? job. But- yes. that Yes. Yeah. Turn right around and go to an ad agency. I don't care if it's a one or two person graphic design shop in Comox. I don't care who it is. But if you go to a small shop and you say, you know what? I have no money straight up, but I want this book to stand out like crazy on the shelf, take a look at this book, didn't see it coming. The condition was it had to win an award. There are no other conditions. So do something radical. Make, it on, make sure it's on strategy. Don't just show like naked ladies or you know, people cutting other people's heads off or something stupid. Yeah. It has to be on strategy, but make it radical. Mm-hmm. Make sure you can spot it from 50 feet away like you can with my book. And, uh, and then go for it. I won't no chains, no shackles, no second guessing, and watch them light up like a Christmas tree. That's like that's like that's like telling a graphic designer that Christmas is coming early. Right. Yes. So anybody who's publishing a book, please don't design it yourself. And don't have <laughs> Amazon design it. Get a get an ad agency and, and get them to to pull a freebie. Well, and if you're going to write the book, you don't want somebody else writing your book because it's your book and you want to write it because you're the writer. So why would you think you can design the book? Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Very right. cool. Well, it was such a treat. Is there anything else you want to sort of run off? We got about three minutes left. If there's anything you want to, well, you know, it's I I, I think uh, the one thing that I want to impress on people, uh, your ultimate speech thing, it is it is a it's a product. You know, that it's priced for executives, so it's not for everyone. But if you're running a business and you want to raise capital, for example, or you want to be the best at conference, you want a standing ovation at a conference, or you've got a big AGM and you've got to impress the board. This is not something you should screw around with because people, you know, you remembered my story. Well, people remember you if you suck as well. People won't forget that. And it's not a good remember. So, uh, you know, it's a little bit of money invested. And if, it, if you're trying to raise money, you can actually actually put it in the investment line of your ledger. It's not an expense. So it is well, it's well worth doing. But I also want to impress on people that we also have other products that are, uh, that are more intended for people who just need a brush up who might not have uh, the full freight if they want to do a personal speech, birthday speech, wedding speech, stuff like that. You know, we can help them out as well. It's not our main line of business, but we do have products that are priced for folks who just need a little bit of a hand too. That is super cool. And when we think about it as an investment, if you go and give that great speech and you get clients from that, it's more than paid itself 10 times over. It does. Yeah. 
It, that it, is it so does, cool. And the problem is that we always leave it to the last minute. Now, the, your ultimate speech was designed for executives who hate to write speeches and leave it to the last <laughs> minute. The speech, uh, just just a side note, if you go to yourultimatespeech.com and you check on Mina Gooley's speech to the Young Presidents Organization in Dubai, Mina and I wrote that speech in 48 hours. So. Wow. That, and that was all, while she was on a plane from Namibia to Spain to Dubai. So it wasn't her working. <laughs> we put that together in 48 hours, and it's a standing ovation speech. So you should that, check it out. Yeah. Well, and that's the difference between having somebody who knows what they're doing in your corner and you guys know what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it makes a huge difference. Um, and, uh, you know, right now we're, we're a young company, so it is a trust-based business. So, you know, you, we're, we're, building a, we're building a clientele who are then telling their friends and telling their friends and telling their friends. But we're lucky in that we now have some video to support our claims to say, hey, you know what, There's, here's the proof. So, uh, uh, so it's not just us trying to sell you a line or anything like that. Don't want to talk to anybody who just thinks I'm selling them a line. But uh, we do have proof that the damn thing works. Excellent. Well, I'm so glad you were a guest on my show. Thank you so very much. It's uh, been a good hour just sitting here jamming with you. So thank you. Thank you very much. And for all listeners out there, you can find Mark at markstoiber.com and you can get more of his brilliance online and you can creep him on Google if you want. So until next Thursday, speak up because you have something to say and I want to hear it. Thanks for hanging out with Natural Born Speakers. But don't stop now. Contact Allison with questions to be a guest or hire her as a speaker. Go to dominothinking.com. See you same place and time next week.